Hey, it's Pete and Reed, and we are at the Seneca Queen on uh, Queen Street in Niagara Falls, Canada. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, 75 years old, what a great building. What a great building Beautiful. if you've been like a big, huge, famous star. Uh -huh. And for people to get up personal and close. Exactly. And I think there's one playing tonight, I'm not sure. Uh, well, yeah, I think there is. Yeah. Multiple award winner, absolutely. Canadian icon, no doubt. Author of Guitar Player Magazine and Music Educator at Humber College. Welcome, Mr. Rick Emmett. Hi, Rick. Thanks for coming. I gotta tell you, we go back to the late 70s and lay it on the line and never surrender. And there's this 612 double neck guitar that's just playing amazing. But what's even better than that is the guy who was singing the vocals, and that was you. Incredible. I mean, and I think kind of like a cross between Steven Tyler, Getty, Getty Lee, Lee, and you all in but, one. But wow. not as nasally as Getty Lee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So now that we said all that. <laughs> well, thank you. Welcome. Is, thank you. It's incredible. I, I can't believe I'm sitting here beside you because you know what? Um, growing up, when I went to many of your concerts, stood in the front row and like, just like gaga all over No, you were in love. You were in love. Uh, oh, yeah. I was just like, ah. Oh. Right? It was insane. And we, I went to see you in Kitchener. And you were playing, and then afterwards, we chased your limo down the road, me and my brothers. That was you. That, yes, and Jim Perry you know, was there. Yes, in, the, in, in our Volkswagen camper, and they don't go that fast, trust me. <laughs> we once had a, a limo driver in Dallas, Texas, and he used to drive Elvis. And we were in the car, and we were being pursued by someone. Yeah. And, and the guy looks in the rearview mirror and says, you want me to lose him? And we go, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. The guy pulled it up onto the sidewalk no and dr and t turned a corner and, and a hubcap goes flying off. And we're down the street. We're all in the back seat going, hey, this is more than we paid for. So, Good yeah. thing you didn't have your head through the sunroof. Yeah, yeah. It would have been like a, like a Belushi movie or something. Oh, yeah, no kidding. So how many years ago was Triumph? Uh, I was in the band from uh, 75 to 88, so 13 years. And I left it in 88. Amazing solo career. I mean, my God. I did all right, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, I <laughs> all think, right. Well, Just once you've had certain kinds of success, and you know, you mentioned about Hall of Fames and all that, yeah. you know, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to live those kinds of things down. You carry them around with you, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, I, I get along with the guys now, and, and we've had a little bit of a reunion back in 2007, 2008, and, mm -hmm. we, and we went out and played a couple of shows, and then Gil, the drummer, kind of said, oh, that's it, I'm going back to golf. <laughs> yeah, I've had that's too much hard work. Oh. So, no, he, he's, a, he's got a real nice business going with that Metalworks. Oh, of course. The studio, yes. the institute, the school, the production company. So. Incredible. I've been in there, it's an incredible place. Yeah. It really is. And so, you're recording in there, aren't you? I am, yeah. We're doing a new record, and... Uh, I've made a deal. I can't really, not at liberty to discuss it yet. You know, it's all signed oh, and sealed and delivered. But not even on the Pete and Reed show. No, I'm oh, afraid no. not. Oh. And the reason is because, the, of course, the, these companies now they want to have that viral ability oh, when the course. records, you know, come out. And so we're not quite finished the recording yet. But uh, the boys from Triumph played on one of the songs, uh, and Alex Lyson from Rush played yeah, on one that, of the yeah. tunes. And nice. Really, that yeah. rumor's around, isn't yes. it? Okay, good. Yeah, and, and uh, that is definitely around. The singer from Dream Theater sang on. Wow. Teams. So uh, we've had a lot of fun the last few weeks, and uh, mixing is ahead. That's not quite as much fun. But no. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do that as well? Yeah, I will. Yeah, with uh, the guys that I'm playing with tonight, Dave Dunlop uh, is a guitar player and Steve Skinley, the bass player, but the three of us have kind of, kind of formed a, a production troika. And uh, so, yeah, we kick each other's butts. Kind of. ah. that's, that's good. You disagree a lot? No, it sounds better this way. No. <laughs> Sometimes the, the energy rises, but I, I think that's a good thing in a way. You I know, you need to have a little bit of that tension from time to time, and um, it certainly takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keeping it real. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you get nervous before you go on? Uh, I still do a little bit. Um, it doesn't take me long to sort of settle. But I, I kind of feel like if I didn't have those butterflies before it started, I wouldn't be taking it seriously enough. You know, um, I feel like, uh, in a way, and you know, I don't want to get too heavy, but when you're a performer, there's a kind of a sacred trust that exists between the music and, and the audience and, and the performer and, you know, the talents and the gifts that you've been given. And you have to try to sort of respect that and, and make it happen night after night. So I still kind of get a little nervous about, you know, uh oh, I hope I can bring it. You know? <laughs> and we're going to hold you right there and we're going to come back with more of Rick Emmett on the Pete and Reed Show.
We are back at the Seneca Queen in Niagara Falls, Canada with Rick Emmett. Now I'm looking at my cue card here and it's spelled R-I-C. Now is that, is that spelled no, wrong? No. no is yeah, it? Uh, it was, it was a standard R-I-C-K in 1975 and uh, the first Triumph album was coming out. Mike Levine, the bass player, was in charge of uh, all of the credits and things and he and phones me and he says, uh, you know, I, I hope uh, uh, everything good. And I said, well, you wrote me a check that you owe me some money for. And uh, you spelled my name wrong, and he'd spelled it R-I-C. And I said, it's not R-I-C, there's a K on the end. He said, oh, okay, sorry. And so the albums came out, 20,000 jackets get printed, and it's not R-I-C-K, it's R-I-K. He <laughs> got rid of the C and put a K in there. And there's 20,000 jackets, and I went, you know what, I'll be Scandinavian, who cares? <laughs> So how did the band meet? How did that all come about? Uh, I was playing in a band called Act Three, and we were playing at the uh, Queensway, like some bar on the Queensway, and they were looking for a guitar player. They, they sort of formed the idea of wanting Triumph, super band with lots of uh, production and flash pots and you know all that stuff. Uh, and they were looking around for guitar players, and they'd actually had a guy named Jerry Doucette. I don't know if you remember him. The mm -hmm. Deuce is Loose, Jerry yeah. Doucette. And he'd sort of done a, a, I don't know what you'd call it, a tryout or an audition or something. And they'd had a, a guy named Freddie Keeler play on a single that they'd made for Attic Records. So they, they had the single out, they had posters printed, they were ready to rock, they just needed a guitar player. And uh, so they came and offered me the job, and then I went through a couple of weeks uh, where I wasn't sure that I was going to stab my friends in the back and leave the band I was in and, and go to them, but in the end I did. And at the time, that band was being managed by uh, Neil Dixon and Steve Propess, and uh, they said to me, oh, you know, you're making a huge mistake. Oh. You should never leave this band and go to Triumph. And then try, I, I went joined Triumph, Triumph became successful, and then uh, later, when we were signing with RCA Records, they said, well, we're not going to just sign a band direct. You need to have management in place. And we hired Dixon Propass. <laughs> so Neil became a manager oh, again. Oh, wow. It's a big circle. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Now, was it, uh, did you guys think you were going to go where you're gonna, where you went? I think that uh, Mike and Gil had a really solid sense that this was going to happen and they were going to make it happen. And Gil, very persistent, strong-willed kind of businessman, and we were a unique band in that regard, managing ourselves, booking ourselves. Um, Gil would function like the production manager, and Mike had a really good background in, in radio promotion and all that stuff. So, I mean, I was really the junior partner, but it was kind of good because it was a balance in the sense that uh, it, it was like, okay, well, Rick, you write the songs and wiggle your butt in those spandex pants, <laughs> and that'll be good. Yeah. I thought it was good. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Chased him down the road. Oh my God, yeah, help. <laughs> Almost getting killed in a limo because of you and Jim. <laughs> Our Volkswagen camper was crumbling, I tell you. <laughs> it's a great time. So you, you made it big in Canada, then you got into the States. Now, were you big in Canada as big as you were after you went in the States, or did you get bigger after you came back? No, I think that's a Canadian thing, especially back in the day. If you had um, a certain amount of success somewhere else, then people at home would say, oh, maybe there might be something to this. And we had gone to Texas originally, and that was where the success started. And then Canadian trade papers kind of went, ooh, oh, hey, hey, guess what's happening? Yeah. So now everybody said, okay, I guess we're going to have to take them seriously. <laughs> not, another, not just another bar band. You know? right. why, so, right. why do we do that to ourselves here in Canada? I know. It's, it's it entertainment, it's time. music, it's everywhere. Yeah, it, it, I don't think it's as bad as it was. And, and, and in truth... Oh, we do. Do you? <laughs> yeah, we do. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there's a certain level of... Um, skill and ability that makes Canadians uh, respected uh, and I like I, Rush opened a lot of doors for us yeah. you know and I think we opened doors for other people in our, in our time but um, I don't know I, I find that there's a, a real respect for, for Canadian art Canadian musicians yeah. in in, uh, in my travels and uh, this new deal I got signed it's a label out of, oh, maybe I'm saying too much. No, it's okay. They're, they're, they're out of Europe. They're out of Rotterdam, really, is where they're headquartered. So you know that there's this respect that exists in these places, and that's a nice thing to know, you yeah. know, when you're sitting in Burlington. Yeah, you know, definitely. Having a tea. Yeah, we got the respect out there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's got to get it back. When you were traveling around, say, opening for other acts and stuff, who was the best band that you, you hung out with that you thought you just kind of had fit there? Oh, I, you know. Well, first of all, I should say, Triumph didn't, we didn't open for too many acts. We had our own show. Yeah. We would rather play a smaller place. That, like in, in the States when we broke, we played a lot of places like this the first time on cheap tickets. The radio station would do a buck ninety nine ticket nice. and wow. we'd put a promo thing together and a record company would give us some tour support yeah. and that's how people would see us with our big show for right. the first time. So that was our, our theory. But we did we opened for Alice Cooper once on a New Year's show nice. in Cleveland. That was quite something. <laughs> I bet it was. Yeah, there were <laughs> That, yeah, there was the backstage. I think we had this much stage to work with, kind of, you know, because there was, you know, scaffolds <laughs> yeah. and dead babies and I don't you know. <laughs> Scaff. <laughs> you know, so that was kind of fun. All the inside scoop here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We got more to come. We got one more second, segment to go here with uh, Rick Emmett, and uh, we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty here next time, okay? Hang yeah. with us on the Pete Reed Show. We're back. <laughs> they got me laughing. We're back. It's Pete and Reed here at the Seneca Theater on Queen Street in Niagara Falls with Rick Emmett doing things behind the scenes he shouldn't be doing. Yeah, he's oh, I can't resist. He's uncontrollable. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, am I? I really want to know what it was your favorite album that you produced or you put out? What, what? Oh, uh, wow. It could uh, be in any genre that you do, because you do so many of them. And there's 19 of them, right? Well, the, yeah, is there that many? Well, that yeah, we counted them. produced 19, yeah, but... I, you know, I lost count. Um, <laughs> but any, any of your favorites. My favorite Triumph one was the Allied Forces record. That was around 80, 81. Mm -hmm. And that had magic power on it, and Fight the Good Fight. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the band really found itself with that record. So I really... Now, that's a special one for me. But my, personally, the ones... The, the first one I made after I gave up making mainstream rock records for radio, I made a classical guitar record that was called Ten Invitations from the Mistress yeah. of Mr. E, which is the guitar. And um, I kind that was a sweet, I'd waited all my life to make that record. Play. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's not like it sold a million, but <laughs> it did all right. Made you happy. It did. That's what yeah. you gotta do, yeah. right? Now you said back when you were with Triumph, it wasn't really rock music. And I have to agree, there was a little bit of difference in there. What was it? Oh, I think the band was uh, eclectic in its own way, and and we weren't uh, eclectic like a progressive band would be. But that was kind of my background, and I liked playing acoustic guitar and trying different things and finger style. And, and um, Gil really liked blues, and he liked you know Bad Company and Ted Nugent. So he was coming from a whole other place rock wise, mm -hmm. and Mike was this laid back guy that he would listen to the Whalers or he would listen to the Eagles and. Um, but, you know, Mike, uh, he was just kind of easygoing. Wh wherever the music went, he was willing to sort of go that way. And uh, Yeah, it, I think that was one of the things that sort of made the band unique in its own way. And I should say, you know, it was always about the show. Like, yeah. Gil was always about, you know, he's going to have a drum riser that would go 25 yeah. feet in yes. the air and spin around and, you know, laser beams and shoot out of its butt. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, he was, he was big on the show. Did that sidetrack you at all? Uh, no, I liked it, and and in truth, uh, you know, I, I was a bit of a ham bone, and and. Uh, that would have and, never get. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Yeah, so you know that it worked out. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have preferred th if the band had become more serious as time went, and the reason that I had to leave it was because I felt like there was stuff I wanted to try and do in my life, and you know, time is short. You, 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 you know, so how hard is that though? Well, you, you, there you are with your buddies, right? And you guys are making it, and then you're telling yourself, "I got to do my thing." That's got to be a tough place to be. It was. It, it was difficult, and and it wasn't uh, pretty when when it went down. It was it was like an ugly divorce, and we were unhappy for. There were well, there were a couple of decades there where yeah, right. lawyers oh. were really the only people talking. Oh. But we figured it all out. I had a, a brother that passed away from cancer, and when he, when he was sick, and he was sort of you know trying to resolve the things in his life, he sort of said to me. You've got baggage that you need to fix. And I went, yeah, smart. oh, you're going to make this be about me. Oh. <laughs> Don't make this be about me. But, uh, yeah. but it's true. I mean, look at the Eagles, you know. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. There was a big yeah. lesson to learn from that, I believe. Absolutely. You once said that music is the soundtrack to someone's life. Um, what would your soundtrack be? Oh, man. 
Uh, Would it well, be your music or and the music no. you created or somebody else? No, no. I mean, at home when I'm you know opening a bottle of wine, I'm listening to Steely Dan probably. Uh, nice. Steely, you know, Me too. I have old Yes records that I really like. Oh, I love you Yes. Know? But when I was in my heavy phase, you know, I was a real Richie Blackmore, Deep Purple oh, kind of guy. Nice. You know that Machine Head yes. era. Like, I thought that was as good as good gets, you know. <laughs> so, you know, Zeppelin was a big band for me when I was a kid. Um, and now I'm older, ah, James Taylor, you know. Yeah, yeah. James good. Paul Excellent. Simon. Yeah. I'm more of a singer-songwriter guy now, you know. Yes, so. and we love it, too. By yeah. the well, you won a jazz award back in 2007, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Smooth that jazz, was, I believe. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah, that was a good thing. That was Dave and I sort of experimenting and going off on another tangent. Three Hall of Fame awards. Yeah. The Walk. The yeah, walk, you can star walk on the walk of fame. Yeah. yeah, I know. And the, the, I got one in uh, Mississauga where I lived for like 37 years. And uh, so it's in this park down by the lake, lovely, you know. And then we moved. <laughs> My wife and I downsized, we moved. And uh, uh, Nancy Walker is a jazz piano player, and I teach at Humber College, and she teaches there too. And I saw her in the hall one day, and she got a star. And uh, she moved to Burlington too. <laughs> and so she says to me, We got to move to Burlington. Yeah, there you go. Quite seriously, she says to me, do you think they'll take the star away? <laughs> Nancy, no, I, I don't think they'll take our stars they'll away. They'll still be there. Okay, yeah. So now let's look at artists who have come back, and lots have, right? I mean, uh, the most famous have come back, and they're in their 60s and 70s, right? And the voices change on some, and they don't change on others. Like, if you listen to Frampton now, his voice hasn't changed. Oh, we did a cruise, and he was on that, and he was fantastic. Yeah, like, amazing. as a musician, as a singer, yeah, yeah. incredible. So now we were just listening to you... Uh, do some Belt some out there. I mean, your, your voice hasn't changed. Sounds now, I didn't great. notice a double neck up there on stage, but... <laughs> no. We were waiting for the, you know, the, the smoke double, to rise. If you wear the double neck, you're, you're kind of <laughs> like this. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alex has a double neck that he still takes out, and he's got a name for it. I can't remember. Like, it was like, you know, a uh, big back buster or something like that. You know, something like that. But, uh, so, no, do you think your voice has changed? Yeah, it has. Yeah. You know, it, it starts to... And, oh, and we, I tune my guitar down a half step, yeah, and right. you know, and some of the songs, the keys have been modified, you know, so that I can still cut them. But um, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a. Um, it's not a bad thing, you know. Uh, if the energy is still in the performance, and you know, I mean, I look at a guy like Tony Bennett, and I go, I okay, love it. Wow, yeah. incredible. Know? Yeah, incredible. Yeah, and you think, okay, just it, can, it can be done. Stop telling yourself that it can't because there's the evidence Proof. that it can. Yeah, well, that's the big exactly. secret, right? The big secret is age is. Well, we actually were talking to Vince Vaughn's mother, Shay. We, had, oh, we interviewed her, huh? and her big. I mean, she's doesn't want anybody to know, but she's 75 years old, right? And she looks like she's 50. Yeah, she's. Okay. Her body looks like she's 25, but she, age is only what you make it. And she yes. goes like, every time you start thinking you're old, you do this. Yeah. Now, I've been doing that the last couple of days. I'm getting, I'm getting bruised. People think, he's, people think he's insane now, but, you know, hey. Yeah, like, we don't want to see you up on stage going, when you do that, do you hear an echo? A <laughs> lot. No, I just said there's a lot going on in there. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> oh, my god. Now, you've got some great things coming up in the future, right? Yeah, well, this album's coming out, uh, and the, I think it's going to be called uh, Res 9, like, we call it Rick Emmett and Resolution 9, and so Res 9 is the short form for that, and uh, that hopefully that'll be out in the fall. And uh, we're still touring around, playing gigs all the time. Is Triumph going to come back? I, I doubt it, yeah. to be honest with you. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, they, they did come and play on my record. The and golfing the, was more important. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but it was nice. Like, yeah. uh, uh, Mike had been down in the Bahamas. He'd been down there uh, for a, a destination wedding or something. And he has a place in Jamaica that he goes to and lives there half the year. Yeah. So, you know, it was nice for him to come back and play on the record. And Gil had already done his thing, and, and uh, that, that's a sweet thing. You know, I think if we tried to push it and take it out on the road, then it would start to seem like it's it's work again. And yeah. you, you don't want it to feel like work. You want it to feel like it's, you know, that soundtrack of your life magic kind of thing. Yeah. Well, we'll keep pushing, what, right? Yeah. We'll keep pushing yeah. Stuff. I just want to know one more thing before we let you oh. go. What can we expect tonight? Uh, there'll be some Triumph stuff for sure, mostly. And uh, uh, Dave and I will spend a little bit of time kicking each other in terms of playing guitar and some instrumental stuff and some of that jazz stuff that you uh, mentioned. Um, and then there's, there's, a, there's some novelty that finds its way in. We might play a Monty Python song. Nice. Now, 
You know when it's success when you made it to Guitar Heroes, right? Did you oh, yeah, it? my sons. My, my sons, too, were playing. Like, Guitar Hero, Mom, it's Triumph. Blah, blah, blah. And you made like, it. What? Yeah, well, it's impressive. Great. <laughs> yeah. Who cares? It's another, you know, another whole era of music. You know, it, I, you know I, don't, I don't really chase it for that. You know, no. it's lovely that it happens. Yeah. I don't really chase it. But it is nice when, like, you know, Alex Lifeson comes to the studio and you're sitting there and you, you feel like, Okay, equals peer kind of. That's a that's a cool thing, you know. When you meet Neil Sean backstage and he he knows who you are, and, right? You know, like that. That's a hit. Well, we hope to catch up with you again soon. Right. Rick, thank yes. you so much for stopping by. Thanks for being here. Right, thank you. And we'll see you next time on the Pete and Reed Show. <laughs>